Welcome to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. I am Tammy Mac. Hi there, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So for the longest time, right, Black, uh, for the longest time, Black voices, Black stories and Black people have not been valued or fairly represented in this country or world, although we have reached represented in the media as being criminals, uneducated, lazy, and the list of negative shenanigans go on and on. But how has this untrue narrative impact the world, our self-esteem, and most importantly, how we see ourselves? Well, tonight, the business of being Black is the importance of representation and why it matters to the black community. Please welcome the founder of the Fresh Dolls, Dr. Lisa Williams. Hi, Dr. Williams. Hey there, Tammy. Extra correspondent and Miss USA 2019, Chesley Christ. Hi, Chesley. Hello, great to be here. The Chief Equity and Strategy Officer for Boston Public Schools, Dr. Charles Granson. Hi, Dr. Granson. Hi, Tammy, it's great to be here and diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist, Dieta Jones. We are ready, Dieta. Are you ready? I'm ready. Hello. Let's, nice to let's, be here. Let's get into it. The first question as I pose every night, why should Black people care? Dieta, we're going to start with you. Why should Black people care about the representation of Blacks? This is our opportunity. This is a moment to uh, shift a narrative that has been um, underrepresenting, marginalizing for hundreds of years. This is an opportunity for us to reposition ourselves, not just in the United States and, and uh, North America, but in the world. So I think we should care because I feel like from a kind of a cultural point of, point, point of view, we are at a shifting point at a defining moment where we can reposition ourselves and center ourselves in a narrative that's really complex and important for us to be part of. Dr. Williams, why should black um, people care about their, their representation? Tammy, you read my mind. I was gonna say the whole reason why I do what I do in creating a line of multicultural dolls is because it is so important for children to see who they are, see their beauty, know their brilliance, know their history. And then when our children know it, it affects this generation and the next generation and the next generation. So it's a rippling effect. But what it also does is it allows other ethnicities to have another standard of beauty. Mm -hmm. And so they begin to recognize the beauty in our curly hair and our curvy bodies and our golden skin tones. Everyone gets to recognize the beauty in diversity and we get to see it in the dolls that we create at the Fresh Dolls. Chesley, let's get in on this action. Why should black folk look? Why should I care about who represent me? Well, to add to what Dr. Williams just said, I mean, she was talking about us being able to see who we are. It's also about us seeing who we can become. Um, because it wasn't until we had, you know, a person of color, a black person hold the office of vice president of the United States and hold the office of president of the United States that those little boys and girls could actually see themselves in that position sometime in the future. So it's about understanding and being proud of who you are, but also knowing that there are, you know, the ceilings that, that, most of us were limited by no longer exist for the next generation. That reminds me of that iconic photograph when the little black boy was in the Oval Office with Barack Obama, rubbing Barack Obama's hair like, oh my goodness, it's like mine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Granson. Yeah, um, so I this. have to start, to start by saying when it comes to representation and why we should care, um, really excited to have uh, the, the other day, the swearing of our first black mayor in the city of Boston, uh, Mayor Kim Janey. Uh, we have a Black woman superintendent, uh, Dr. Brenda Caselius. And when we look at um, why we should care, you know, it's uh, interesting. I saw the other day a uh, statistic that uh, the median household net worth for Black Bostonians was $8, right? Um, and that's compared to uh, over 200 grand uh, for their white counterparts. Wait, um, oh, wait. Dr. Median Grant, net worth. Please, please clear that up for us. Median net worth for I, Black I, Bostonians. $8. That did not sound correct. Yes. That sounded off base to me. So can you please Absolutely. repeat that, those statistics for me? Absolutely. So a study was done a few years ago um, called the culture of wealth. And you can look that up 
um, and it showed uh, that the median household net worth for Black Bostonians was $8 when you looked in comparison to their white counterparts, we're talking about over 200 grand in terms of median uh, household net worth. Um, and so when we look at statistics like this, and then when you look across uh, education, the criminal justice system, um, and a number of different areas, we continue to see um, these kinds of trends. And we know that it's because of a systematic, uh, historical, intentional program, right, to subjugate. Um, and so when we look at uh, why it's important uh, for us to um, uh, be so intentional about how we combat that, um, I, I often say, you know, it requires work, it requires energy. Um, but uh, I like to say we have to bring our Harriet energy because uh, I'm sure Harriet Tubman didn't want to make 200 trips back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Dr. Williams, I'm going to come back to you on this one. Do you believe in the saying, you are what you see? Absolutely. But can I go back to my brother's comment just a moment ago about the inequity? I want to say as a Black woman entrepreneur, you see the same statistics. You know, there's a recent study that came out in Babson College did a study, and they said less than 3% of companies led by Black women get venture capital. Mm. It's like 2.2%. Think about that. 2.2% of black women receive funding from venture capitals. That makes it very hard. That's the number one challenge. And if we're not getting from venture capitalists, it's very hard to go and get it from a bank. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what my brother just said about building up economic wealth. Well, it's hard to do that. We are brilliant people. We have drives, we have ambitions, we have visions of something we wanna create with a company, but you gotta have funding. And if there is an inherent bias when it comes to financial, uh, you know, venture capital and the bank loans, it makes it very difficult. And it, it's going to it continues to repeat itself generation after generation. So then I want to move back to Dr. Granson on this and ask you, how does representation affect that either positively or negatively? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think we have to be um, at the table. Um, and not only do we have to see ourselves, uh, you know, but uh, different races and those who hold power uh, have to see us. Um, and sometimes I understand they can make their head explode. We saw what happened in the United States Capitol in January. Uh, that was that was about uh, eight years of, of a, a black presidency and a black family. Um, and then uh, and, and hostility pent up over years. Right. Um, you know, there was a historian said that the Civil War uh, was not something that was ended, that ended, it was delayed, right? And so we saw it show back up uh, with Jim Crow. Uh, we continue to see it show back up in terms of how uh, different government agencies um, um, uh, interact with our community. And so yeah. um, uh, how we show, how we are represented and who's in those rooms um, becomes important. And, Can I and, jump in though? And, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, go, ahead, I, go right ahead, Dieta. I was going to jump in and just say that, you know, it's also about not just how we show up or the opportunities for us to be at the table, but it's also about our uh, ability to be confident enough to actually come to the table. So mm. let me go back to Dr. Lisa's conversation about venture capitalists. I was recently having a conversation with, uh, in preparation for a summit for women entrepreneurs, specifically black women entrepreneurs. And over and over, the venture capitalists were saying that women were not positioning themselves with the same level of aggression. Now, I'm not suggesting that we've had the same level of preparation, but there also is this thing called internalized oppression that has kept so many women, right, because of our gender and also because of our race and all sorts of things that have to do with systemic racism and barriers, et cetera, that oftentimes leave women not coming to the table and not coordinating and collaborating with each other in ways that actually position us to be really um, attractive to those venture capitalists who have very specific criteria that are necessary in order to get inside of those channels. So some of it has to do with us also reclaiming this moment, really taking it upon ourselves to figure out how it is that we kind of represent ourselves and represent with each other in a way that's going to allow us to really bring a full force that we haven't necessarily experienced before this. I have so many questions right now. You guys have like just lit me on fire now. Uh, and, and let me tell you, when I'm on fire, it's about to be on and popping. So let me calm down real quick. <laughs> Deanna, I want to ask you about something you mentioned originally when you said we have to reposition ourselves. So my question is, why do we have to reposition ourselves if we already know that we're in a position of 
of, of higher education. We're in the position of uh, our own uh, in uh, our own corporations. Like we are in position. So why, who, why, and who are we position? We repositioning ourselves for. I think we're repositioning ourselves for ourselves, right? Some of it has to do with kind of our own mojo that's been lost over time because of oppression, because of barriers, because we have kind of been living in this swamp that's filled with toxicity that has left us feeling lesser than or feeling like we don't deserve or feeling like we shouldn't be ready yet to come to that big table, when instead, I think we should be creating the tables, right? We should be kind of reconstructing the narrative about it's not just us trying to play the game, maybe we should be inventing the game or reinventing the game. And so I, I'm not suggesting that people who have um, held power and been in dominant positions in the United States macro culture, for example, don't have responsibility. Always people who have more more power have more responsibility for initiating the change. But I also feel like now is a really important time for us to come together and unite and actually uh, show what we have in a way that allows us to really kind of dismantle hundreds of years of oppression. Yeah, and see, I don't think I don't think that that is. Uh, I don't think that for for some reason I don't feel like that's our responsibility. I I think that it's the responsibility of the people who have shackled us to reposition their thoughts about us because we already think highly of ourselves. I don't think as many Black people think as low of uh, like think less of us uh, as we make it seem. I, I think black people are ready to create the table. I think black people are highly educated. I think black people do. Um, I mean, it's the other side that can't okay. see us in the way that we already see ourselves. Um, Chesley, I see you trying to get in here and I'm gonna get you in as soon as I get this commercial break in. We'll be right back on the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Welcome back to the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Today, we're talking about why representation matters in the Black community. And before we get back to our panelists, we are going to our Fox Soul mates. So let's see. Therese, we love you. Thank you for chiming in. Most Black families were not taught generational wealth, Therese says. Jen J says, uh, population size makes no difference. Oh, I guess they're talking back and forth. They're, 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 they're talking back and forth in the chat. So I got to catch up with the conversation. My bad. I, I got it. I came in late on the conversation, y'all. So let's take it from the top. NCOG. What's up, NCOG? Black people should care about the images depicted because we live in a global society. When an unbalanced representation is put out there, it gives us a false or monolithic perception. Yes, we're with you on that. Uh, white people are afforded a plethora of images, but when it comes to us, the powers that be seem to uh, uh, be content in putting out the lowest common denominator than a wide array of representation. Therese says we have to create our own positive representation of our heritage. So that's where we're coming into the conversation at. Gotcha now, Therese. Okay, okay. Um, we still got folks fighting over blocks they don't own. Ooh, ooh. Mm. Ooh, okay, all right. Then Gentile Killer says we're only maybe 15% of the population in North America. We don't own nor control the infrastructure of mass media. These tangibles give way to us being exposed, exploited, and scapegoated. We still have a huge gap between economic growth and wealth in the community. To our white counterpart says Ibrahim. I, I hope I pronounced your name right there, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. OK, um, so uh, Chesley, let's get in on this. Yeah, well, I think that people are right. You know, they're talking about, you know, elevating themselves. And in order to do that, you need not just a seat at the table. You need a, a seat at the head of the table. And so we need more powerful leaders who are elevating other people. And, you know, I think Deanna was talking before the break about, you know, internalized oppression. And I think she's so right that we end up um, not being able to elevate ourselves because we're constantly thinking, like, am I good enough for this? And part of that is obviously lack of representation, lack of meaningful and powerful positive representation. And part of that is the lack of leadership, lack of, of us being able to see like, oh, well, this person was a CEO, they did this, these three things. Maybe I can reach out to them. Maybe they'll serve as a mentor or a sponsor to me and hopefully help me to elevate myself. So it's really about us being able to, you know, get those leadership positions and not just show, you know, a positive example, but pull up other people with us. 
You know what? I love that comment. So let's talk about that. When it comes to the CEOs who run for uh, who run Fortune 500 companies, only six are black. What does this say? And only one is a woman. Oh, it makes me so mad. But she's a, she's a you know she's a great woman. She's a powerful leader. It just you know whenever I think of this, I talk about you know Fortune 500 companies and lack of meaningful leadership all the time, and it just makes me so mad. Not just for Fortune 500 companies, but in the legal profession, I practiced for a couple of years as a civil litigation attorney before switching careers. We have never had a black female Supreme Court justice. Never. And there, I mean, even beyond that, if you look at state Supreme Court justices, I think there have only been like four black women to be state Supreme Court justices in history ever. It, I mean, so it's, it's really, really important. And it's sad that we haven't reached a level where people see a pathway to that kind of success. Mm-hmm. Well, then what is the difference between underrepresentation, since you're talking about that, we're, we're now talking about the numbers of Black people we see in these positions. What is the difference between underrepresentation and misrepresentation? And how can they impact a Black person's self esteem? But let's just start with what's the difference, uh, Dr. Goodson, Dr. Yep. Granson? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Uh, thanks for that. You know, and I, I just want to say to, to connect it to earlier comments there, you know, I think um, I agree with Toni Morrison that. Uh, racism a problem that was created by white people and it's their job to to dismantle it uh, keep us out of it um, and so the, the idea when we talk about uh, you know representation and I, I know earlier we said we have to be at the head of the table I agree with that I think also we have to make sure that we remain vigilant around a collective uh, plan um, and that we hold whoever is at the head even if they look like us accountable Right. And so, you know, I remember when uh, President Obama first came president. That's my brother. I love him. Um, uh, But I'll say uh, that, you know, I wasn't one of those ones initially jumping for joy because it's not just about having a black face. If that was the case, one of my professors used to always say we could just have Daffy Duck. And so the idea is that um, we need to make sure that we have people who are have our best interests uh, when they don't, when they forget when they are um, catering to other constituencies. Um, And sometimes that's their job as politicians. Uh, Our job is to remind them and to be there uh, as a constant reminder of our history. Black people have shown up historically in a number of ways and shown that confidence. And so I go back to this intentional uh, subjugation program, right? Black Black Wall Street in Tulsa, right? We own the businesses. Our businesses are doing better than the white businesses, right? We were there, right? Um, And this happened in a number of different places. And intentionally, we were told this is not your place because whiteness cannot exist and be something of value if blackness is valued. Yeah, yeah. And now we're shifting the narrative. Like think about what's happening in Atlanta and in Georgia right now, right? And that's part of what, I mean, absolutely. There's a lot of, you know, absolutely power is an important um, part of this. We have to take into consideration. Race is something that white folks should end. Racism is something that white folks should end. There's no question about that. But there definitely are opportunities right now for us to be able to really make the case for how it is that we can exert tremendous power when we come together. So now it's about, oh, you don't wanna let us vote? All right, so we're gonna boycott this company and this company and this company. Now all of a sudden we're gonna hit people where their capitalist pockets sit in a way that's really going to have an impact and gonna really allow people to understand how it is when we come together, we are forced to reckon with. And that's the opportunity, I think. Yeah, I wanna uh, quickly say that to Sunda um, Brown Duckett, will become the fourth black woman to head a fortune 500 company effective May 1st. And when uh, when she secedes, uh, Roger Ferguson, who announced his retirement from TIAA in November after a 13 year run as CEO. So that would make two. uh, Also Rosalind G, I'm sorry, Rosalind G Brewer. So so we've got two on there. (laughs) Chesley's jumping for joy. I'm beaming. I'm beaming because I mean, it, it really, it's so frustrating. And I think for me, especially as a black woman, you know, we, we've all, I'm sure we've all talked about intersectionality. It is so frustrating that so often people talk about the plight of black people and forget to talk about the plight of black women or black queer women. And there are just, there are layers to this. And so when you don't see yourself represented in these incredibly and important leadership positions, it can be incredibly frustrating, not just because 
because, you know, it's hard to imagine that you can get there, but also because you don't have, you don't have the, the voice that you want. You don't have somebody who actually even thinks of you. You just, you know, you know, you have people who think generally of people of color, but not somebody who's wondering like, you know, about the violence that happens to black women, about, you know, our lack of representation in media in front and behind the, the camera. So things like that are, are very frustrating. They hit me hard. And oftentimes I find myself just like stewing over them because it affects me personally. I, when we do shows like this that talk about representation, what I hear the most is that representation to many companies, and I'll, I'll bring this to you, Dr. Williams, representation to many companies means creating some diversity department and sticking a black person in it as the head of that department. And the companies feel like, well, we did our job. Oh, and don't forget now, make a public statement and send some money to a black college. <laughs> It's a three I've never sent money to my college, Bennett College, yet. I'm a little upset about that. I, my platform hadn't reached that far to get some dollars for Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina. But go ahead, Dr. Williams. <laughs> but that's not enough, right? That's just window dressing. What we want to see now is we want to see active change. We are tired of the PR statements that just that. It makes a statement and there's no change. We want change. We want power. We want people not just sitting in the chairs, but those that have the power to make decisions. And that's mm. vitally important and incredibly important. You said you had a story to tell, Biggie. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> a story to tell. I got a story to tell. You know, I was the first time representation. So I was the very first African-American to get a PhD from the Ohio State University in marketing and logistics. Now, the reason why that's important is they had never seen anyone who looked like me. So one day we're sitting in class, very first week of the PhD seminar. Dr. Granson, you know this process about the PhD seminars. The professor comes in, he's late. He apologizes. He says, I'm sorry that I'm late. I was on the phone talking to a colleague of mine. We're gonna start a maid service. And we've decided that we're only gonna hire black women. Hmm. I'm sitting there now, y'all. Now y'all gotta see now, wait a minute. I've only been a PhD. I feel like this is a part, like, this is some week. part of the test for your dissertation or something. Yeah. Okay. Tammy, I had only been a PhD student for two weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and wait a minute. And then so I raised my hand. Excuse me, doctor. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about? Because he said he only wanted to hire black women because black women knew how to serve, right? I know, I know. So I say to him, what you are talking about is slavery. Oh, no, no, no. See, you, you all are so sensitive. You all are so sensitive. We would hire black men, but they're either in prison or on the street corner listening to rap music. Did that really happen? I swear to God, my Lord, take me and my children right now. That happened. That happened. My first, my first two weeks within a PhD program. So what do you do? when something like that happens. I spoke up. Now, what's also interesting is that we are often hidden in the room. Now, I, I acknowledge I was the first black person in the program, but I'm in the program. I'm sitting in the room. He apparently didn't see me. And even though I'm voicing my opinion, he did not hear me. But you know, hard work and intelligence, which we have running through our veins, because when they brought us across in the slave ships, it was those of us who had the power, the determination, the brilliance to continue and to live. And that's what pumps through our veins today. Right. Fast forward mm, four years, I outranked him. That's right. That's right. I outranked him. He saw me at a professional conference. He says, I understand you're a full professor now with a multi-million dollar endowed chair. I am. Right. Well, blow me over with a feather, he says. <laughs> His brain could not accept the fact that a black woman could be smarter than a white male. And he couldn't accept that a black woman could outrank him in a matter of four years. There had to be something wrong. So that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about systematic racism and ingrained racism. They don't see us. They don't see the possibility of what we can do. But we do. And as long as we continue to push forward, we'll continue to make those strides and we'll be in the room. We'll be either CEOs of other companies yeah. or what I really like to see is CEOs of our own companies. Let's take a break on that note. It's the Tammy McLeod Show on Foxhole.
Welcome back to the Tammy McLeach Show on Fox Soul. Hi, everybody. Hopefully everybody's good out there because I know I am. Uh, please welcome to the show the founder of the Fresh Dolls, Dr. Lisa Williams, is here with us today. Extra correspondent in Miss USA 2019, uh, Chesley... Chesley Christ. I keep wanting to call you Christ, girl. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> the Chief Equity and Strategy Officer for Boston Public Schools, Dr. Charles Grandson, and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategist, Deetta Jones. We are talking about representation today, and Dr. Williams just left us with a big bang of a story about uh, <laughs> how one of her colleagues said he was about to hire a uh, uh, open up a maid service and hire black women and didn't want to hire black men because black men were either in jail or rapping on the street corners. And um, Dieta kind of said off air that this is one of the reasons why black women are kind of fleeing the educational system. And I, I know, um, Chesley, you talked about how people are fleeing uh, the loss, you know, the, the justice system. And yeah. so my question is, do we stay and fight the good fight? Do we, like Dr. Grants, Granson mentioned earlier today, do, do we Harriet Tubman this thing out? <laughs> or, or do we make a, a mass exit from these places that aren't respecting us? Or as Dr. Williams would say, seeing us. Yetta, <laughs> we'll go to you first on this. I, you know, I have to say, I had this exact same experience because I was in higher education personally. My first master's degree is in higher education and I spent most of my career working in academic institutions, but I chose a different path. I love higher education. I love the idea of education. I believe that it's a, an absolutely essential element for empowerment, but I decided this is where I could have more leverage as a CEO. And so I started my own consulting firm where I actively look to hire black women. <laughs> I go out of my way and I tell every single person who works for me, we are looking for black women. We will definitely keep an open mind about qualifications and criteria and positions. But I felt like that was an opportunity for me to still be able to do the work that I love in the higher education system and also to be able to affect change where I actually had absolute control over decisions that were being made. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chesley, I'm waiting. I mean, I think it's up to you because it's obviously not our responsibility to fix the problems that other people instituted. So I don't have to clean up racism because I didn't start it myself. Like y'all got to fix that. Um, but, you know, for me, I, like I said, I was in the legal profession, 75% of women, uh, black women who are attorneys could seriously consider leaving the legal profession at some point in time. I'm one of them. I left the legal profession. I'm no longer practicing law. But on the other hand, I did stay on with my law firm as a diversity advisor, because even though I didn't want to be subject to, you know, people people asking me for my bar card when I went to courthouses to, to show that I was an attorney. I didn't want to be subject to walking into depositions and having the court reporter ask me when the attorneys are coming. I didn't want to have to worry about that anymore. But I did, on the other hand, worry about, you know, the black uh, female summer clerks who we had coming in. And like, what is your um, you know, legal career going to look like if nobody is here to advocate for you. And so for me, I decided, you know, I can't do the legal profession anymore as a legal professional. However, I can stay on and tell you guys how to fix this uh, while I continue to live my dreams and, and do the career that really is something that I love to do and is accepting of me and, and changing um, through now, the years. No judgment here, but I do have a question. Yeah. Do you believe though that staying adds to the representation that we're talking about and leaving takes away that representation. Yes and no. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, on one hand, it literally does. Yes, staying literally does add to our representation, right? Because without Black people staying in the legal profession, no, we won't have those partners or those managing partners at law firms who then bring on, you know, other associates and, you know, elevate them to the status of partners. But on the other hand, as a diversity advisor, I can teach this firm how to bring in large swaths and keep large swaths of black people. So on one end, yes, like I'm leaving, because I'm no longer accounted as a black attorney, as a black female attorney in the firm. But on the other hand, I'm bringing in three more, I'm bringing in five more and teaching my firm how to grow and, you know, sort of add to the soil that need that we need to sort of grow um, that representation within the firm. Because when I when I hear you, I, I sort of I, I immediately started thinking about Sojourner Truth, Fannie Lou Hamer, yeah. you know, and, and those women who kind of had to struggle through the movement and be the one to take those blows to the face, if you will, literally <laughs> take blows. Yeah. 
know, and, and they didn't leave. They didn't walk away. They stayed there and it made it better for us. It, it gave you the opportunity to walk away or stay, to even have the choice in the first place. But I, I do respect that the decision is very personal and, and, and that either way, will work out to our advantage. I, I do respect that. So I don't want you to think I don't respect it at all. No, um, no, it doesn't sound like it. But it's oh, okay. also transforming. I mean, this is also about structural transformation. So for example, in higher education, there are so many more people now who the number I personally for 30 years have been doing the kind of consulting that I do. And I've spent so much time talking to black women who were not given tenure and they had no idea that they were not even close or that they had any possibility of not receiving tenure until actually the decision came through. They had no coaching, they had no feedback, they had no way of being able to make a pivot that other people would have been afforded. And over and over and over again, it had to do with things like temperament or seemingly hostile or things that have to do with personalities or things that are seem more cultural. And so for, to be able to say, how is it that we can help people think of alternatives and also if a mass exodus starts to happen in ways that really start to have a negative impact on some of these industries that really do care about representation or are being held accountable for it, maybe we can actually get to some of the structural change that needs to happen. Maybe this is the opportunity to really structurally change some of the ways in which the legal profession has bias in it or that higher education truly has bias in it. Maybe this is forcing that structural interrogation that's so necessary. Yeah. So I want to go to this clip that this just happened uh, uh, over the weekend, actually, Friday, I want to say, in Palmdale, California, where a teacher was having a conference, a Zoom conference with a parent. And look, these Zooms been getting a lot of people in trouble and a lot of people fired. I don't know if I like them or if I love them, to be honest. <laughs> I just really don't know where I stand on these Zooms. Uh, but they are the most transparent pieces of technology that exist today. Please take a listen to this. I mean, these parents, that's what kind of piece of they're black. He's black. They're black family. I know it. You know? I'm seeing what you're not going through. Yeah, that's what yeah. happened. There's no problem there. Your your son has learned to lie to everybody and make excuses. Are you saying? Because you taught him to make excuses that nothing is his fault. This is what black people do. This is what black people do. White people do it too, but black people do it way more. You know so many black people. <laughs> that, that, I'm sure she has like one black friend. Right, because you That's know so hard. many black people. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, that, Dr. Charles, I have to get your yeah. take on this. Yeah, I mean, you know, that that those words could have easily been the words of a mistress on a plantation, um, a part of the intentional lie um, uh, and putting in the minds of young people um, that they are lazy when, in fact, uh, our people are the ones who have built the infrastructure for the country um, when other people didn't want to work. Right. Um, and so when we look at um, the majority, overall majority of uh, teachers in our uh, education system across the country, um, are, are white women, right? That is the phenomenon. Uh, and when we look at who's in front of our young people, and it goes back to this question about um, how we uh, respond when we're not comfortable in environments. Um, yes, we know that we have a shorter lifespan because partly because of fighting racism, right? And, and being in these environments and having that experience. Um, and so we have to start to look at this as like a relay race and tag team um, because um, it, sometimes we can't take it, but we do need folks to stay in these, uh, um, uh, whether we're talking about corporations or in the classroom. Um, we need teachers who look like our students in Boston Public Schools. We made a commitment to uh, try to achieve uh, a workforce that reflects the students we serve. We're over 80% Black and Latinx, uh, Asian, uh, American uh, students. Um, and it is an ongoing uh, struggle. And we, and we, we propose for our teachers to be about culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, which obviously what you just heard was the complete opposite of that. Right. What's interesting to me is it seems that white people have it both ways. They call us lazy, uneducated, uh, and 
whatever the negative stereotype is of black people. But then when we say, hey, there's racism, they're like, no, it's not. Look at Oprah, look at Obama, look at, I mean, they, they go to all of these great black people who made extraordinary, I mean, not just nice little small <laughs> pieces of success, but extraordinary, I mean, extraordinary amounts of success that not even white people have achieved almost as, as the example of, why there's no racism, mm -hmm. but at the same time, tell us how lazy we are. I'm just not sure how that works both ways. Yeah, or on the other hand, they'll say, you know, they'll say, well, yes, there's there's racism or whatever, um, or, or they'll downplay racism altogether and say, there's no racism, you guys just need to work harder. And then we work harder, we achieve these incre incredible feats. And they're like, well, you just got here because of affirmative action or a black person helped you out. You didn't actually get here on your own merit. So they get it both ways a lot of times, either by denying racism or by saying you only got here because of your race, sort of adding it as if, you know, it's some advantage now on the back end, now that I've worked twice as hard as you did. Yeah, exactly. Um, something happened over the weekend that was interesting to me in terms of representation. And I want to talk about it when I come back on the Tammy McLeod show on Fox Soul. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Tonight we're talking about representation in the Black community or representation in America for the Black community. And I have my most esteemed guest here, Deetta Jones is with us, Dr. Lisa Williams, Dr. Charles Granson, and Chesley Christ is here with us to talk all about it. So I have this topic that I'm kind of tossing in tonight because it just like literally happened. Um, Jimmy Fallon had a young Instagram influencer on his show that was a white girl who demonstrated TikTok dances to his audience. And boy, did social media go crazy because all of those TikTok dances she demonstrated were TikTok dances that were created by Black folk. I know you want to talk about it, Jessly. I do. You know, I, I, I love TikTok. Follow me on TikTok at Chesley Chris. Um, no, it, it really is important. And this is this is not the first time this has happened on TikTok. I know Dr. Williams was talking about, you know, the other musicians historically who have had their their dances, their music, their style, their flow uh, ripped off by white people without any credit. Um, and we're, we were just seeing this again. Addison Rae, you know, she's doing this dance that these two black creators made um, and originated on the on the app. And I, I didn't watch the Jimmy Kimmel show, but I'm assuming that the back is coming Jimmy from Fallon. her. Sorry, Jimmy Fallon is, is coming from her not crediting them and not saying I'm doing a TikTok dance that these creators made. You should follow them at this because there's nothing wrong with doing a, a TikTok dance. I mean, you right. do a TikTok dance and it's viral on the app, but you got to credit the originators. It's, it's so important to do. And that is exactly what representation is. So you get this white girl on the show to do all these dances and everybody thinks it's her snit, it's her, her, you know, it's her thing. And, yeah. and look, you're right. You have to credit the person who did it. You have to. Can you please, Dr. Williams, talk to us about how important this is and why people are so upset at Jimmy. Look, let, let me say this first. I'm a Jimmy Fallon fan. Huge. Loved him on Saturday Night Live. Thought he was the cool hip on trend. I mean, he has the roots as his band, y'all. Come on now. <laughs> like he is the quintessential uh, white Arsenio Hall, if you ask me. He's up on his pop culture. You know, he, he brings in the black guests and everything. And, you know, I, I mentioned this on my radio show earlier today and my producer said to me, but why is he cool? Is it because he's been validated because he stands next to black men on a daily basis? Mm. Did the roots give him validation in the black community? Mm -hmm. and, and then that's where you talk about a lot of times we think that we need white people to validate us, but a lot of times mm. it's the other way around. We actually have the power and it's black people who they need to validate them. Speak on it, Tammy. Speak on it. Exactly. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. 
<laughs> You're right. And what we saw with Jimmy, it's nothing new, sad to say. We've been seeing this for generations. They, you know, Elvis Presley did it to our black creators and black artists, you know, and, and the record labels, of course, would get the intellectual properties and give the artists a Cadillac and say, hey, there you go. You got a Cadillac. But all the money is being reaped and stored into the record labels coffers. This is not new, but what is new is that we are woke now. And so we are calling people out on it where before it was just the way things happen, right? The black person lost their credibility. I mean, lost their, their credit, lost their intellectual property. But now we're not having that because we see shiny examples like Tyler Perry, who says very clearly, never give up your intellectual rights. Then we saw little Richard fight for his. We saw yeah. Prince. In modern day, we saw Ooh. Prince. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. We saw Prince fight for. So now we're no willing, we're no longer willing to allow things like what happened on TikTok to go in silence. We want to speak on it. We want it to, to change. So I applaud all those who are speaking up and saying, give this. I a got second. a feeling right. we're gonna see a Jimmy Fallon show real soon with these black folk on it doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, yeah. baby, that show, those producers are like, they are on their phones and their computers right now. Like, who did it? Who did, it? Who did the savage? Who did the savage dance? Like, <laughs> let's when you look at um, When you look at original American uh, music and something that you can say actually derived from here, pop music, right? Black music, black culture is that, right? Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things is we, we find historically, as Dr. Williams just said, you know, black people will create and discard and white people recycle and document. Um, and that is because they own the means of production, right? They have the ability to do that. Um, and so what we hope to see and what we hoped happened, right, is that there were some people on Jimmy Fallon's staff that say, no, we're not doing that. No, 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 that's not, that's not going down like that. I'm not going to be here if this is going to happen like that, right? And we can't do that every, every day. We can't qu quit our jobs every day, right? Uh, we need to have uh, income um, and we want to be able to build our own. And hopefully you don't see that being perpetuated by our, by our own people when we own when we do own um, our own means of production, um, uh, but you know it, it it will continue to happen uh, as long as uh, they they have creative control. And but this is another that. reason why representation matters because I if there's say. someone at that writer's yeah. table, at that producer's yeah. table, right. at that creative exactly. table that right. could have said with authority and with some sort of power, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hey, maybe we should rethink this bring her on, then maybe do the real artist or let them be side by side and do it. I mean, you know, no one's opposed to a white person doing a TikTok dance, mm -hmm. but come on. We talking yeah. about like crazy. Or somebody who knew. You, can, you, you can get them on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, or at least somebody who knew to look for that. Because honestly, before I saw this, before I saw, you know, the Addison Ray is side by side with the TikTok originator to that dance, I didn't know that it was Black women who created that dance. I've seen tons of people on TikTok do it. And so I think it's a fair assumption to say, like, yeah, maybe Addison Ray went on there and maybe she didn't know who created it. Maybe the producers didn't know. But I think knowing, you know, having those people in place who know the right questions to ask mm -hmm. is important. And, and so now he can make it me, right. What's, what's funny to mm -hmm. me is I actually thought it was like, a sketch like I didn't think she was literally demonstrating the dance I didn't think she danced that well so I thought it was, it was like it was a part of the joke yeah they were giving her these black dances to do and she couldn't mm -hmm. quite couldn't quite get the rhythm but what do I know <laughs> Right. Uh, let's right. go to our soulmates here. Incock says, I went to Cornell's diversity certification program. We discussed that part of the problem is that the diversity professional often struggles because of a no buy-in from the top. It starts mm. with the board. I'm not exactly, I, I, you, Dr. Williams and, and Dieta, you're shaking your heads in agreement. Dieta, please talk about that for us. Absolutely agree. I believe that the kind of contemporary best practices related to kind of integrating equity, diversity, and inclusion into organizations is to make sure that at the very senior levels, there is absolute buy-in and accountability and a commitment to action, not a commitment to words, not a commitment to hiring a person, not a commitment to a program, but commitment to action over time in a way that is integrated, that is structural, that is behavioral, and that is sustained financially. So I do. I absolutely um, agree that the kind of the contemporary shift is to uh, to take a very different path than what we have taken around equity, diversity, and inclusion work in the in the past. 
I'm going to go to our soulmate, Bella Lords Santiago. Why are we the only race of people who doesn't stand up for one another? Our brothers and sisters stand by silently and watch injustice inside of the workplace. I think it speaks to what you were saying, uh, uh, Dr. Granson, is that we don't really want to lose our jobs. Yeah, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, we all have to be able to also, um, uh, because it's a, another, another form of wealth and, and health, lay our heads on the pillow and really uh, be able to sleep uh, well at night. Um, and knowing that we did the right thing, it becomes um, about ethics. Um, it becomes about leadership and courage. Um, and it becomes also about strategy because it doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice yourself and be just, we don't need martyrs, uh, as Marion Wright Edelman says, no one needs to die, um, right? People have already done that for us. Um, but we need to be really um, thoughtful and planful um, about how we're going to leverage those who are um, in our community, our larger community, partner and partner up with the folks who are uh, a part of our um, uh, workplace. Um, we have a group at Baltimore Public Schools uh, called uh, the Black and Brown at Bowling Group. That's our, our central office group. Um, and after uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, all of those staff members came together, wrote a powerful letter um, to uh, um, uh, the white staff. Uh, and the white staff came together and wrote a response. Right. Um, and since then, they've been working with leadership to hold leadership, us and leadership accountable to following through. Right. So there are ways uh, and there's been a historical playbook. Yeah, um, I'm, I went to school in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, <laughs> so I spent a lot of time there because I got my BA, BS and master's there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there are always these, these, I've been able to talk to the people who were a part of the Woolworth movement in mm -hmm. Greensboro in, in um, 1960 on mm -hmm. several occasions. And I remember one of the stories um, where I was speaking to, 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 to someone who was a part of the movement that said that there was a woman behind the counter who was black, who chastised the four brothers from a and for mm. sitting at the table and basically saying to them, you're, 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 you are basically saying to them, look, you're, you're shaming your people, go mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. This is not good for us. Mm -hmm. Damn it. This is not new either. They did when Martin Luther King was coming and, and doing the marches. There were African-Americans who were telling him to go home. Black folks were telling Martin Luther King he was an agitator when what he was trying to do is liberate them. So mm -hmm. this is not new. So in many times we say, yo, it is not our job to educate, you know, white America. I can give you that. But I think on some level, we have to educate our own people because not all of us are woke and not all of us know the truth. And that's part of the reason we create the dolls. So they hope we start with the little ones and letting them know who they are. But it's important it. for our people to know we came from kings and princesses and queens and we're powerful people. Yeah, love it. And we're going to talk about those dolls and much more when we return on the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Welcome back to the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul, where tonight we are discussing the representation of Black folk in America. If you want more of this Fox Soul content, subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you hit the notification bell so you can get all the best updates, the new videos, the live shows. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and tell us how you feel, how you feel. Uh, if you're just joining me, I've been talking to the founder of the Fresh Dolls, Dr. Lisa Williams, extra correspondent in Miss USA 2019, Chesley Christ. Also the Chief Equity and Strategy Officer for Boston Public Schools, Dr. Charles Grandson, and diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist, Dieta Jones, about the power of Black representation. Uh, Chesley, I can't, look, the way you talk, I, and look, do not slap me in the face for this. Oh, no. <laughs> Please, I am about to be so stereotypical. It's ridiculous right now. Okay. But it seems like you could care less about this 2019 Miss USA <laughs> competition because of the way you talk. I mean, you are in a very small crew of black women who, um, who have amassed uh, that kind of reign in American pageants. So congratulations to you for that. But the work that you do outside of that is so impeccable that it kind of overshadows that uh, <laughs> that feat in itself. So let's talk about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm an extra correspondent. I'm an entertainment news correspondent. So I just talk to celebrities for fun. Um, and but beyond that, I'm also a diversity advisor at Pointer Sproul. I run a fashion blog called White Collar Glam and just recently expanded into a jewelry line as well. Um, so people can cop my jewelry on shop.whitecollarglam.com or just check out the blog at whitecollarglam.com. It's where I talk about um, professional clothing that women can wear to the office, which I think is so important because you don't have to wear boring clothes to work. I mean, I'm wearing, I got a little leopard. dieta has got a little bit of cheetah over here. We've got Dr. Lisa in some color. You as well, Tammy Mack. And so I think, you know, having those exciting clothes is really fun. Um, but even beyond that, it, it's exciting to be able to elevate Black stories through an important platform like Extra. I mean, we've talked with Anthony Mackie about his new show on Disney+. Plus. We talked to Cynthia Erivo about her new show portraying Aretha Franklin on Nat Geo. So, so many incredible Black voices that are getting, you know, that are, are being heard because of Extra TV. And I'm excited to work with them. Absolutely. Dr. Williams, please, fresh, jo fresh, fresh dolls. How can we get a hold of fresh dolls? You can check us out at thefreshdolls.com. And I just have a few right here talking about representation. So we have one of our male dolls because I want people to know that we are brilliant. And I love how he looks so chivalrous. You, you, do, have to tell, you do have to mention that you have male dolls because when people think of dolls, they think of women. Younger. These are dolls. These are like action figures with fashion. So we do have women dolls. Also, obviously, our Kylie doll. Mm -hmm. And they can be found on our website at The Fresh Dolls, but also at Walmart and uh, Family Dollar, as well as Target and Macy's. Yes, we love it. Wow. Deanna, please, the Inclusive Managers Toolkit you developed. We all need to get it. Oh, it yeah. is, actually. It's one of the, it's a, it's a 10 week intensive. Um, leadership and managerial program um, because most equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies that have tried, been tried in the past fail because they might have visionary leaders or really amazing folks who are doing wonderful things at kind of a grassroots level. But what really helps to fuel transformation, culturally speaking, is managers. If managers aren't cascading the messaging, if the way that they're actually managing, communicating, coaching, developing, giving feedback is not consistent with the strategy and is not really touching the people, then a strategy will fail. So we really focus on strategy and education, but the Inclusive Managers Toolkit is something that we can roll out to an entire company, to an entire university, and actually globally. It's in multiple languages, and we offer it for tens of thousands of people every single year. Thank you. And Dr. Granson, take us on home with the Boston public school system. All right. Well, in the Boston public schools, um, we are taking representation seriously. We are uh, under the vision of our superintendent, Dr. Brendan Conselius and Saren Daly, who does our diversity recruitment retention, uh, doing a grow your own program where we are taking uh, high school juniors and seniors and telling them we will hire you. you uh, we'll stay with you, complete your undergraduate degree. We'll bring you back every summer and have you uh, work uh, in classrooms, um, and we'll guarantee you a job when you graduate from college. Ooh, we love that. That's representation at its finest. Thank you all for being on the Tammy Mac Late Show. Dieta, Dr. Williams, Dr. Granson, and uh, I cannot wait uh, to, to watch you on, uh, <laughs> on television, uh, <laughs> Chesley. And since you're on TikTok, I might join now. I might Thank join. Thank you. I'll be your first <laughs> follow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. Uh, that's the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Until tomorrow, everybody, it's a blessing to be in your box. Bye, y'all.